Hey, me team, and then I'm gonna talk about Scorecard. It's a very uh, cool open source package that we just released. So uh, yeah, I'm very excited to to talk about uh, about this with my co with my colleagues. Before we start, uh, just a quick introduction introduction who we are. Basically, we are the risk and pricing analytics, and as the name suggests, we are responsible for development of machine learning models for the for the risk and the pricing domain. The team consists of roughly 15 people. It's very international. Uh, if I did not miscount, I think we have nine different nationalities and very multi, uh, multiple backgrounds. So we have people from computer science, engineering, physics in the team. Now we are focused mostly on machine learning models, but now and then we encounter also what we tend to call traditional models uh, that are scorecard models. And at the end, you will see why also we decided to kind of develop this package and and, uh, and, uh, and open source it for you. Now, before we move, let me give a quick introduction what uh, what a scorecard uh, is about. So basically, scorecards are the way how uh, risk models, how uh, loan decisions were being taken for quite some time in the bank. And this dates back to, let's say, the late 80s. And back, in the, uh, back at the time, you pretty much have something like you see on the, on the left. You have actually a scorecard, so you will have some variables here. You will have some, uh, let's say, uh, reference uh, fields, reference buckets, and for every bucket, a customer will get will get an amount of points. In that case, assume we have a John. John is 31 year old, falls in this range. This means we we'll get 25 points based on his income. He will get 28. There are multiple multiple steps. He gets a final total score in this case of 238. This number means nothing, but also means a lot. And uh, basically, if this score is above a given threshold, the loan is approved. That's that's how it worked. However, back at the time, uh, there was no real modeling or optimization. How these buckets were defined and the points. Does it really like the bankers playing playing behind and based on some business knowledge or so on? How did we evolve since the 80s? That's almost 30 years. Well, actually, scorecards are still uh, quite used in uh, in in banking. However, they are slightly different. And what really changed is the way how we develop them. Uh, so feature selection is normally done and the way how we define the bucket, these are optimized steps. So I'm gonna see a bit later. Uh, the way how we assign the point, it is the optimization. And basically the, the final sum of the points is linked to a probability of default. Now, how we are building this, you're basically having different values of points for different features. You sum them linearly. You're in a binary classification setting, so uh, pretty much, uh, pretty much, you're trying to uh, to predict if the customer might default or not. And you know, linear combinations and binary classifications usually call for a logistic regression. However, these tricks to basically define these buckets and how we assign these points, you will see actually that they make a simple logistic regression model way way powerful, and that's also what scorecard uh, scorecard includes however in a traditional kind of process developing this is a lot of manual work and usually lies without the outside the data science workflow what i mean here is that uh, yeah as a data scientist when you enter into this you suddenly have to deal with a lot of excel sheets with a different uh, different type of software that you're not used to and yeah this is not very convenient at least from a data science perspective so that's why we decided to build scorecard uh, what is scorecard? It's an open source package, and basically it provides a toolkit to build scorecard models in a scikit-learn compatible API. Note that uh, the K in scorecard is not a typo, as K relates to scikit-learn. That's why it's like this. And what problem does it solve? Well, the two main problems I mentioned. Automates part of the tedious, uh, tedious part of building these traditional uh, models and integrates nicely in a data science workflow in, in Python. Uh, before I move on, just to give an idea how well this performs. So normal scorecard models, they're gonna outperform any logistic regression. And in general, they're gonna be performing always worse, but can get very close to, let's say, three ensemble models like uh, like uh, XGBoost or IGBM or so on. And there are actually some fundamental reasons why, why this is happening. Here, uh, I just try on a dummy data set and you can see actually the results. If you look at the rock AUC of, of this model, you will have the logistic regression scoring around 0.65, the scorecard at 0.76, and the random forest at 0.77. So it's getting pretty close. Uh, now you should ask, like, 
why should I actually care about this? Well, uh, because what uh, what this is implementing, there are a few simple tricks that are known for a long time in the creators domain, but they're not usually known in, 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 the, in the data science community that can actually boost logistic regression performance. Uh, this can, if you use scorecard, you can develop quickly a baseline model that is a very, very simple model, and you can use it as a baseline for any machine learning uh, that might outperform this. It's then easy to implement. As you see, actually, at the end, you're gonna end up in, a, in kind of a, something that you can uh, implement even on a paper sheet. And in addition, there are quite some nice reusable components that can be reused in your ML uh, workflows. Just to give you an idea, two slides on the theory behind scorecards. Uh, basically, there are three main steps. You can already guess what they are. There is a variable discretization. This is the bucketing. This is the part that is done univariately and is very, very uh, intense manually to, to develop. And that's where mo most of the automation comes in. There is the part of the, of the encoding. Uh, basically, uh, this is explained uh, on the next slide, especially the way to evidence encoding like oh, what it does. And at the end, once you do these two steps, you're basically building logistic regression on top of this. Know that these steps are nothing else than cyclone transformers. You put it in a model, you get a cyclone pipeline. It works amazingly well within this context. Now, why do they outperform the traditional models? Basically, what this kind of bucketing trick does, it, uh, it, it kind of deals with nonlinearity. Now, assume that you have a feature X1 here. This feature X1 has this type of relationship with your target. Here I'm talking about the log odds because that's what is the linear component of the, of the logistic regression. Once you discretize them, so let's say you, you define four buckets, basically you're compressing information and you're destroying this nonlinear relationship. And then you can do any type of encoding, but the weight of evidence encoding has this very nice property that if you transform, uh, basically the weight of evidence is nothing else than looking at the fraction of target zero over target one, taking the log of those for each bucket, this is what you compute. And the nice property it has that is linear in the log odds. Uh, and actually this, this can be proved very, very easily. Uh, what does this mean? That basically now if you transform the weight of evidence and you fit it into, into the logistic regression, you have a linear thing that the logistic regression is going to manage very well, and that's where the performance boost actually is coming from. There's nothing more than that under the hood. Now, just to get a parallel with uh, with uh, three ensembles, actually three ensembles are very, very similar under the hood to the scorecard models. And uh, what I mean here is that uh, three ensemble kind of perform a, performs the bucketing in a sense that when you build, when you build a single tree, the tree algorithm uh, kind of every leaf can be matched to, to a bucket. There is the major difference, and that's where ensembles actually gain their, their bigger, biggest performance boost, is that they treat interactions while scorecard model don't. Then when you encode, basically you have you're basically mapping every leaf value to to to, to a number, uh, depending per algorithm. And then at the end you do some sort of linear combination, which is scorecard models is fitting logistic regression. In three assembles, you basically combine weak learners into strong learner. Now the scorecard actually implements kind of univariate bucketers, and that's going to be the the three decision bucketer uh, that kind of runs this thing univariately. So if you basically build a random forest with one feature per tree, you're basically building a scorecard under the hood. And this is really really quickly the theory behind scorecards. And now I will leave the floor to my colleague Ben, who is going to give you a, a demo to see how these bucketers actually work. Yeah, exactly. Hey, hopefully you can hear me. If not, then I uh, just give me a quick shout. Uh, and yeah, you should be able to see my screen as well. So I'm just going to take you through, as Sandra said, a basic overview of what we already have in the scorecard package, implementing all of the theory that Sandra really nicely just covered. Uh, so first, what we're going to do is just load a really simple data set that just contains two variables of each type, so two numerical and two categorical variables, which you can see. Uh, here, so education and marriage being the categoricals, the limit balance and the bill amount just being the numerical ones. So bucketing the scorecard, we're first just going to take a look at a really simple bucketer just to show you all of the main aspects that come along with the different bucketers that we have. And then I'll show you the more sort of, uh, let's say, exotic bucketers that we have inside this. So let's just start with the equal width bucketer. Now, the way that this works is that imagine you have let's say a variable where you can see it distributed here along the uh, along the x-axis. Well, essentially what this um, what we might want to do is to bucket this here, a continuous variable, 
into some buckets of equal width. So here we essentially have, um, we want to bucket this essentially, in this case, four times. Each one here has the same width as the previous one. So pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, so here, what is contained in the buckets will be different number of um, different number of instances. But let's say that we want to implement just this equal width bucketer. Well, it's really easy to do. We firstly import from scorepad bucketers our equal width bucketer, and we want to go ahead and just fit and transform this immediately on our data. So we have our x and y data. Notice that we firstly uh, specify the number of bins that we want to put the data into. So in this case, four. And we want to go ahead and pick the uh, name the variables that we want to put into this bucket. So in this case, we're doing both of the uh, numerical variables that we have. And so you just specify these variables as a list. You go ahead, fit transform, and you can see now that essentially what has happened is that the limit balance and the built amounts, which previously had lots of numerical variables, uh, are now essentially just put into uh, these buckets, a so maximum of four buckets each. And you can see when we look at, for example, the limit balance unique, there are indeed four unique values. So that's pretty straightforward. The really cool thing about the scorecard package is that it implements, uh, we can implement it, it's compatible with scikit-learn. So immediately what you can see here is if we put it into a pipeline, for instance, scikit-learn pipeline, where we take our equal with bucketer, but then take other pieces from um, scikit-learn, such as the one hard encoder and a random forest classifier, we can immediately just create a pipeline from this, fit, predict, and there's no issues with this whatsoever. So this is really cool. Some of the aspects that belong to all of the bucketers, I'll show you now. So for instance, after we've fitted uh, our bucketers, what we can see, for instance, is a bucket table. So here we create a bucket table per feature. So what we have here is the bucket table for the limit balance. And we can see that essentially what we did was we specified give us four buckets. And we do indeed see four buckets here, zero, one, two, three. We also have a special bucket for the missing values. In this case, we don't have any missing values, so it's just zero counts. But you can see the labels, so the boundaries that are provided by the bucketer uh, for each of these, and the counts and the percentage of um, counts inside these buckets. So pretty straightforward, but very nice to see, just to be able to see a more granular overview of what the bucketers are doing. Now, often when it comes to bucketing your values, what you want to do is you want to take some special values and put them in their own buckets. These special values might uh, mean something, um, let's say, more than normal than your than your other variables, or than your other values, sorry. And we can very easily implement this inside our bucketers. So for instance, if the value of 50,000 in our limit balance meant something unusual and we want that in, a, in its own bucket, we can very easily do that. Similarly, if we want to bucket anything between 20,000 and 30,000, for instance, in its own bucket, we can easily do this. We firstly just define a specials dictionary. Again, we want to look at four bins here. We say, look at the limit balance, pass through the specials, and pass through the remainder. Now, this remainder essentially means that any variables that we do not specify here, we can just uh, we leave them untouched as they are like this. So the bill amount, for instance, has not been touched here. We can also drop a lot of the variables so it only transforms the variable that we specify here, but in this case, I haven't done that. We can also specify here a missing value treatment. So often you might want to put your missing values into their own buckets. You might want to put them into the most common bucket or the most uh, the bucket with the most um, instances of class one, for instance. Uh, and we can specify that here. So in this instance, what we do with the missing treatment dictionary is we say any missing values in the limit balance, put them into bucket number two. And you can see here, for instance, this is indeed the case. So we have bucket number two here. And we see that first we have this boundary, but also the missing values exist in here as well. So that's really nice. The default value is to just put the missing values into the right bucket. We can now begin to plot all of the underlying data. So this essentially, this bucket table here, we can begin to plot this into its own nice little bar plot here, just showing the um, yeah nice visualization of exactly what it is that we've been putting into this bucket table. So you can see here, for instance, there's more counts inside this bucket here than the others. And you can see if I hover over it, it's a nice interactive plot. So that is really nice. 
So let me just take you through briefly before I pass on to Tim and Fink, the different buckets that exist inside this package that we've created. So in a similar vein to the equal width bucket, we have an equal frequency one. So in this case, instead of saying that we want to have um, equal widths of buckets, now we want to have an equal number of counts per bucket. And this is, uh, you can see here, for instance, if we had this variable, then this would be a smaller bucket because you're capturing so many instances. And as you get further and further away from this mass here, you would need uh, buckets that get wider and wider. So this next bucket would be really, really wide. We have an agglomerative clustering bucket. So this is if you have, for example, um, main sort of points of mass inside your data. So imagine you've got your data distributed here where you've got three main points of mass. It essentially just uses the agglomerative clustering that exists within scikit-learn uh, to essentially just bucket these. Again, very easy to just import this bucket and immediately uh, invoke it in the method that I showed previously. The nice thing here is that so far, I've just showed you what to do with numerical variables. But we do have um, cases where you can essentially manipulate the categorical variables. And we do that, for instance, with this ordinal categorical bucket. So here you can, um, for instance, have it where now your categorical variable gets bucketed in a way such as the most popular, uh, so the, mo the most common instance of this category gets put into bucket zero, the second most bucket one, two, three, and so on. Now I want to talk about the supervised bucketing that we have. So before everything that I showed was just unsupervised, it doesn't need to see the target that we have that goes along with this. There are some now more sophisticated bucketers that I can show you. Uh, I shout out should go out to the opt binning package. So here they put in some really nice monotonicity constraints, for example, when it comes to the class one and some extra uh, things like this. So definitely worth checking out if you want to get more involved into, um, let's say, scorecard specifics. And the way that we can essentially implement this, you see now I'm essentially implementing a fit transform with both X and Y. So it's using the target to generate the buckets for this limit balance. And here we don't even need to specify the number of buckets. It tries to figure out the optimal number of buckets here. And so you can see here, um, for example, bucket eight, bucket three and so on. So this is automatically being bucketed. Putting all of this together that I've just shown really briefly, what you can see is that in a more sophisticated approach, what we would have is the variable specified, the variable type, so categorical in this instance, the maximum number of bins that we wish to see for a particular variable, how we want to specify, how to treat missing values, and the minimum size per bin. So here, at least 5% of the instances must be present in a bucket for it to become a bucket. Otherwise, there will be no bucket. Um, so this, in the end, is when you want to start getting more and more sophisticated. You'll add more and more, let's say, uh, parameters into this. We also furthermore have a decision tree bucket. So here, essentially just using the decision tree algorithm from uh, scikit-learn to again, pick the sort of optimal number of buckets that we want. So in this case, the limit balance. So this is really cool. After this, again, we can go ahead and plot the bucket table. In this instance, what we see now is a really nice, sophisticated uh, granularity of what exists inside this bucket. So, the label that exists for each one. So we've declared some specials, for example, for 50,000. This gets its own special bucket, minus three. This other special for minus four, the bucket for missing values, and the 10 remaining bins that have been decided, how many of the class one exist in this bucket, how many class zero, and so on, known as the event rate here. This is the percentage. The weight of evidence and the information value also provided. And again, what you can see now when you plot the uh, plot this bucket that we have. It also gives the event rates. If you're plotting, for example, defaults, this would be the default rate. Um, and you can see this sort of organized via the event rate here. So this is uh, really, really nice. If you want to dive a little bit more into the uh, granularity of what exactly the, the bucket is doing under the hood, well, you can look at the features bucket mapping. So here, what you can see essentially is the, the name of the feature, the type, and so on. But I think a really cool thing just to demonstrate before I now pass on to Tim is the fact that you can save these buckets that you generate into an output. So for example, here we're saving this decision tree bucket into an output YAML and it looks something like this. So it will save the name of the feature, the values that go along with each of the buckets and uh, the specials, things like this. But the really cool thing is that then we can create another bucket from this file. So here what you can see is that I load this output 
and immediately create a bucket. So for instance, let's say I change this value, I put in 99999 here and save this. I can now immediately load this um, bucket there. And what you see when I look at the bucket mapping is that this is indeed automatically just been implemented. So in a nutshell, that is all of the functionality that exists right now in the scorecard package. And I will pass over to Tim Fink. All right, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Sandra. So we've covered the theory, uh, we've covered the bucketers, and it's time to put everything together. Uh, there is, however, one more problem, and that's uh, the fact that in practice, we usually take a two-step approach to bucketing. So uh, there is uh, the raw values, then you do some pre-bucketing into about uh, 50 to 100 um, buckets, and then you start fine-tuning it into, let's say, 5 to 10 buckets. And the reason for that is to make the uh, optimization problem from there to there a little bit simpler. It also makes it easier to incorporate domain knowledge from experts uh, and also makes it easier to tweak a little bit with uh, constraints on your bucketing. For example, in monotonicity, that the event rate per bucket is either decreasing or increasing. Um, so for that, we've made a special type of bucketer called the, uh, oh yeah, so this, this also doesn't work. So um, a sequential, pipeline, um, we just bucketed twice. The problem is the special values are not propagated. Um, the, the bucket mapping from the raw value to final bucket that Dan just showed also doesn't work if you do it in two steps. Um, and the inspection with the bucket tables is also not uh, not easy to, uh, to inspect. So we made a special bucketer called the bucketing process. And it's, it looks like a lot of code, but it's not that bad. Basically, you now have two pipelines, one here and one here. There's the pre-bucketing one, where you bucket any features that, uh, that you want. And there's uh, the final bucketing. And you can specify the specials as well. And then you have a bucketing process. Uh, and this will take care of uh, all the bucketing. Uh, and this bucketing process works uh, the same as any bucketer. So let me show you. Um, this is the same uh, bucketing process, but then with some data loaded. Uh, I have a data set, and I take this bucketing process over here, bit transform it, and now it's bucketed, and I can use exactly the same methods uh, as Dan described. So this, for example, a summary, uh, and now you see the number of pre-buckets, that's new, and the number of final buckets, from 14 to 10, from 15 to 7, uh, you can also inspect the pre-bucket table for a feature. So, uh, we get 12 buckets here. And then the, the bucket table. Uh, and the same for the pre-bucket table uh, plot and the bucket plot. Um, and you can do the same trick. So if you want to get the, uh, the raw um, uh, buckets in a YAML file, uh, this bucketing process will do all the math to uh, get the transformation from raw data to final bucket. Um, and that's basically what we need to put everything together. Um, so to build our final scorecard pipeline, a uh, quick recap of the theory from that, uh, from Sandro, we bucket our features over here. Uh, we apply weight of evidence encoding, and then we build a logistic regression. So in code, that looks like uh, our bucketing process over here, a weight of evidence encoder that we also uh, implemented this scorecard. Uh, a column selector in case you want to do select some features and uh, the logistic regression. We have a variant from scorecard that's only there to show some uh, some extra stats. Um, and again, this weight of evidence encoder that's just um, translates a bucket number to the uh, the log of the event ratio uh, or the, uh, let's say the default rate or the bad rate uh, of each bucket. Uh, and that's it, actually, except this uh, pipeline is a bit verbose. It's very common. So we also implemented uh, the scorecard class. So this over here is what you would use in practice. Your model is a scorecard where you supply a bucketing process, and then you can fit it. Um, and that looks like uh, this. So that's it. And this is a, you have a get stats method. So you see all the features in your model. 
and you can access the bucketing through model.bucketing and you can do all the same stuff as we've shown before. Um, and uh, like Sondor said, it's a really good baseline. So you could just uh, also call scorecard without any parameters. It will use the default bucketing process and it will auto detect the categoricals. So uh, this is everything you need to do to use scorecard as a, as a baseline. And you can see, uh, uh, see the AOC of a scorecard model and compare it to something else in your problem. So to conclude, so that's a really fast conclusion. Uh, Scorecard is open source. It offers reusable scikit-learn components uh, that are also applicable outside of credit risk. It offers a really good baseline, so don't check it out. And it's compatible with a lot of other scikit-learn compatible tools. Uh, and we have some really cool plans for the future, including interactive dash apps to do some manual bucketing. Uh, we'd love it for you guys to be involved, so go check it out on uh, Scorecard. Let us know what you think. Uh, open some issues if you find uh, or if you have find some bugs or have some ideas. I think we might have a little bit of time left for Q&A.